fantastic. Thanks so much for coming along today. And also, thanks so much to Dan and Carol Burak for sponsoring the series, to Professor Croc for the invitation, uh, to the Department of Anthropology for such a lovely welcome. Uh, yes, yeah, great to be here in Vermont. It's my first time in the state, and I'm greatly enjoying it. Uh, so, yeah, today I thought I'd talk about the Americas in a new age of discovery. And I'll start uh, with my, where I work, which is the British Museum. So this is the uh, first national public museum in the world, and it's very much a product of the old age of discovery, uh, which dominated between the 16th and 18th centuries. When I think, as I was saying to a class in the anthropology department this morning, the, the orthodoxy of European understanding of the world was fundamentally challenged by the material culture and ideas coming across the Atlantic. And those, those challenges to ideas formed a new way of thinking in Europe. It really led on to the Enlightenment period. And the founder of this museum, Sir Hans Sloan, uh, traveled to the Caribbean in the early 1700s to carry out his research. And it was that sort of challenge of orthodoxy that led him to found this museum in 1753. It's quite a sort of chaotic institution, and perhaps indicative of that chaos, depending on who you ask, there are between two and eight million objects in the museum. Uh, it's a, a vast encyclopedic collection of material culture from throughout the world. So my responsibility is the Americas. I look after an absolutely phenomenal collection of material culture from the Americas, covering everything from the Arctic down to the Antarctic. In fact, in my second year, I acquisitioned two survival suits of the British Antarctic Survey. So, uh, yeah, it's a huge realm covering 39 sovereign countries, an enormous collection, which is both archaeological, uh, historical, and contemporary. So I still collect objects today that reflect changing cultures and identities in America today. But working in the British Museum is a, is a, is a, can be a bit of a challenge sometimes, to be honest. I mean, it, it still has some of that old ways of thinking. And, uh, and particularly when you think about the 20th century and the 19th century, there was one question that dominated the British Museum. And that question was, what are the origins of Western civilization? That was the sort of question which dominated the institution. And therefore, the Americas just didn't fit into that narrative. It didn't fit into that narrative. So, the whole edifice of the institution, this big neoclassical facade that you see when you walk up, it has this atmosphere that I think is, is hopefully changing. So, um, so a couple of years ago, we did a big Day of the Dead event at the British Museum. And so we commissioned a, an artist called Tupac Martir from Mexico to come over and do a video projection to try and deconstruct the edifice of the front of the museum. And so what he did is you got this the projection, which is the neoclassical facade. So you have these columns going up, and then this very nice sort of uh, almost uh, yeah, Greek, Greco-Roman uh, elements of design. And then he got the monarch butterfly, which represents the souls of the Day of the Dead. And then he projected the monarch butterflies to come and colonize the British Museum. So that the souls of people would come into the British Museum, colonize the facade, and then represent a sort of rebirth of the institution that would try to change its perspective and try to bring in a new age of discovery that looked at new ideas, new ways of thinking about the world. And uh, yeah, it's a fantastic projection. I haven't got time. It goes on for 10 minutes. He's also got, uh, he's got juggling skeletons throwing, uh, throwing skulls across the front of it in very Day of the Dead fashion. It's a, it's a remarkable projection. But I think it's important that not only sort of psychologically do we deconstruct old ideas, but we actually physically do it. We think of new material ways of communicating new ideas and new ways of thinking about the past. So I actually spend about five or six months of the year, every year away, predominantly in the Americas. And so I cover, uh, I do an enormous amount of field work and lots of different projects, and I spend a lot of time working with different indigenous communities throughout the Americas, uh, both North, Central, and South. And it's important to say that I actually inherit a lot of those relationships. I'm often talking with perhaps the children or grandchildren of the first people to come and talk to my predecessors in the institution. So I'm carrying on relationships with, uh, with people like the top there is um, Chief Edensu Jim Hart with his son Gwalaga behind, who's Eagle Chief of the Haida Nation. 
And so he first came over three years ago. He was just doing some research, checking out different collections, coming up with ideas. We got chatting. And then I went and visited him up in Old Masset in Haida Gwaii two summers ago, and we were chatting. And here he is um, carving uh, the reconciliation pole outside of his shop. And so this was a pole commissioned as part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. And so he was carving it outside the shop, uh, and we were chatting about it. And then, luckily, about six months later, uh, Professor Croc and I were in uh, Vancouver for the raising ceremony. And, uh, and we were raising it up and getting this big community action together. And I love this pole, and it's got fantastic stories around it. And one of the stories I asked Jim about was there was a, there's these children. There's a series of children who are all holding hands. Um, just in the middle here. And so there's these children all holding hands, and they're barefoot, and they're holding hands around. And then as you go around the pole, there's one child who is lying down and wearing shoes. And I asked Jim, like, what's the significance of, this, of these children? And he said that um, it's, a, it's a reference to residential schools as a, sort of, as, as, as a concept, but deeper than that, he, that, the shoes represent a disconnection of people with the past. And if you create a disconnection with the past, then people lose their roots and they lose their way. And therefore, the idea is that people have to stay grounded with their past and understand their past in order to really have values that are appropriate for their lives and their society. And I think that that thought as an idea is absolutely crucial. Because I think in an age today where uh, our species is accelerating at an ever-increasing rate, people all too quickly forget that sort of trajectory of our society and understand our past in a meaningful way. And all too quickly, we can lose our values. And I think in many ways, only sort of archaeology and anthropology, these ways of studying people, can start to bring narratives from the past and the present that can look at society and the challenges we face in very different ways. So this is just, uh, you know, just a, a graphic of the Anthropocene, looking at how humans have developed a, a very changing planet. And even though our species has been on the planet for more than 200,000 um, 200, years, there are more, pe more of us living today than have ever lived before in the entirety of that history. And we're using more resources, and the way that we're living is changing. But we need to understand that sort of acceleration within the trajectory of our species. We need to create different narratives of understanding and explore an age of discovery in a different way if we want to start to solve some of those challenges. And so today, what I'd like to do is talk through a few themes of what that new discovery might be. First of all, I want to look at how different communities need to have the ability to access discovery, become discoverers themselves. And then I want to look at technology as a, as a tool. And then I want to think about communication. So for the, yeah, so the first sort of case study, thinking about different ways uh, of communicating and looking at the past, I'm going to take us to the Amazon and to a tributary of the Amazon called the Rio Tapajos. And so this is just south of the town of Santarem, and that Rio Tapajos goes right down deep into the quite remote parts of the Amazon. And in uh, an area about 300 kilometers south of that um, red dot live the, uh, the Munduruku community. So the Munduruku um, is a word that actually means uh, the red ants, which was a, a name allocated to them by their neighbors, the Paratintin. Um, and so it's a name that became synonymous with the community, and now they use it to themselves to self-identify. They're a community of about 13,000 people uh, with two predominant clans, the white clan and the red clan. And they live uh, uh, yeah, on the banks of the river in the Rio Tapajos. In the British Museum, uh, we have a, a fantastic collection of Amazonian material, some of the earliest objects collected from the Amazon, from the earliest explorers, uh, and, and significantly, uh, a great collection of Munduruku objects, about 43 objects collected in the early 1800s by two Austrian naturalists called Spix and Martius. They traveled up the Amazon and collected these objects, and I knew about these objects and had them in the collection, and, and, I, and then about Three years ago, uh, I got into contact with a couple of old friends who were over in London, and they were doing some PhD work, and they were Bruna Sigaran and Benicius Onduratu, and they were two Brazilian anthropologists who were, were going to work with the Munduruku. So I took advantage of this and said, look, the next time you go up there, 
Can you present to the Munduruku Assembly, the sort of little government structure of the Munduruku, and say that we have these objects in the British Museum, we'd like to open a dialogue about them and sort of start a little project to think about how they might reflect environmental change in the region, how we might start to think about the materiality of today and some of the issues that the Munduruku might wish to communicate through these objects. So um, we also have the, 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 the imagery of the, this time. So this is Spix and Martius, and this is a representation of a Munduruku warrior from uh, 1882. And it's in a wood engraving, and, uh, and I, I want you to remember that image. So what we did was we took high-resolution photographs of all of the Munduruku collections in the British Museum, and then Bruner and Vinicius went up the, up the rivers, up the tributaries, and then went and opened a dialogue with the Munduruku. And so they showed them the objects that we had in the collection, and they were amazed that we had these objects, uh, which were, you know, 200 years old, uh, and with this amazingly large uh, featherwork um, and very elaborate objects. And then we started to, to ask them some questions about, about the objects and about what we should do with them. And one of the chiefs of the villages is Cacique Juarez Shao Munduruku. And so this is a conversation between Bruna and Cacique Juarez Shao. So if you read the transcript, it'll start to move up in a second. And uh, yeah, just read this and listen to the transcript for just a, a moment or so. Uh, Aquela arte no meu cu. Uhum. Você tem um recado para eles? Não sei nem como eu mando esse recado para eles sobre isso. Mas o que eu tenho, eu tenho que dizer é agradecer eles pelo que eles guardaram até hoje essa, essa fantasia dos Manduruku. Né? E a gente. Eu agradeço essas pessoas que. Tive cuidado com, com essa fantasia Munduruku. É, porque a gente teve mais um conhecimento com a fantasia do Munduruku através do, desse curso que naquele dia o Deusiano estava falando. Né? Primeiro a gente estava usando já o cocá era do, do feitio dos parentes, do Tantini. Aí que eles foram resgatando mais so what I love about that is that um, Chief Kwarasal Munduruku is making a connection between the objects and knowledge. He's seeing the objects as vessels of knowledge that can be used to communicate information. And then this really sparked a, an interesting dialogue with the Munduruku. They wanted to understand more about these objects and the knowledge behind them. And also, what I really liked, was, which what Bruno said, was that they really sparked an intergenerational communication about the, the craftsmanship in creating the objects, some of the birds which no longer existed in the region, the different processes of manufacture. And they, they, the, the objects which encapsulated knowledge performed a role within the society, which was interesting. So then, a year later, um, the Munduruku had, uh, had a, a bit of a disaster, which has been ongoing for a while, but it flared up again, which is that there's a, a mega dam project to build a dam across the Rio Tapajós and flood large areas of the Munduruku territories. And so, funded by a charity, uh, this is two other chiefs of the Munduruku. This is Casigial uh, Adelmir Cabu Munduruku and his brother Arnaldo. And so, they came over, and when they were here in, Lo in London, not here, over in London. Uh, when they were in London, they came in to the British Museum to, to keep this, this chat going. And they looked through all the Munduruku objects and they spoke Munduruku to each other, which they don't normally do when they leave the Munduruku communities because they were in the presence of the objects and the power of the objects. And two very remarkable things came out of the, um, of the, uh, of the visit. The first was that they found that on the labels that Spix and Martius had written, they, uh, they referred to the black clan of the Munduruku, which was a sort of ancestral clan which no longer exists, but it was known about amongst the community, but then they, they sort of they, 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 they went out, they disappeared. And, uh, and then the second thing was that the geographical detail of where they were recorded was very, very good. So the Munduruku could use this in their land title claim bid 
with the Mundurik authority to establish where the territories were in the early 1800s as part of, the, uh, as part of their bid to, to protest against the dam. So not only did the objects have knowledge and have power, they, ha they are connected to the modern world again in a very different way, which could never have been anticipated when the project began. And so then, yeah, as part of the, the dam building process, it, it got press and attention about how objects could be used in the British Museum in very new ways. And it was exciting. And then the Mundurukou went back to the community and they created these signs uh, which, they could, they, which they could then put around the territory of the Mundurukou. And remember that, that, that image I asked you to remember from the 18, uh, 1800s woodcut? They then did a depiction of a man called Karo Daibi, who is their ancestral figure, their, sort of their, their key warrior in the ancestral realm. And they used the woodcut engraving as inspiration to create an own self-identity of their figure that they had. And so you're seeing very interesting interplays uh, with how the, the materiality of the objects then connect through and the agency of the Mundruku in deciding the narrative of their own past in their own way. And then very kindly, Cacique Juarezao Mundurucu and Arnaldo Cabo Mundurucu came down uh, about six months later, down the river Tapajos to Santarem, and they brought one of the signs with them, and they gave it to Bruna and Benicius to give to the British Museum. So now we've got one of these signs in the British Museum, which will go into the new Latin American gallery as a sort of testament to that narrative. And it provides a lovely cycle through. And in terms of new age of discovery, the key point here, I think, is that agency is given to all who wish to discover now. We live in a modern world in which people can choose to set their own agendas, their own questions about the narratives they want to create from the past. And that is a complete transformation from the old age of discovery. So now we'll move on to that sort of second theme, which is of technology. And I'll start, and we're moving geographically up to the ancient Maya world of Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, Belize. And it's a fantastic culture. I don't know how many people have here, here traveled to those uh, ancient Maya sites in, in the world. Fantastic, a couple of people. Great, wonderful, yeah, fantastic. Because there's an inspirational place to travel. And also wonderful narratives, again, that I think play uh, an, an important role. So I'm interested particularly in the ancient Maya because of the theme of urbanism. I think that the ancient Maya were extremely good in creating complex urban landscapes that adapted very well to the particular environments within which they were set. They had very low density urbanism, incredibly clever ways of creating agriculture within an urban environment and managing water in clever ways. And I think those are ideas that can play through into modern urbanism in important ways. In fact, large areas of northern Guatemala were much more heavily populated in the past than they are today. And so how we can distribute population through landscape is a big challenge that we face today. But talking about technology, I'm going to talk through the story of this man, Alfred Maudsley, who is the greatest British explorer that no one in Britain has ever heard of. And uh, he's a remarkable man, and he's a, he's a product of technology because his father invented the nut and bolt uh, in 1800 and made uh, huge amounts of money. And then, like all, uh, well, some many spoiled children can do, uh, he blew it all. Uh, but fortunately for us, he blew it in a good way. He quit his life, uh, as his first job, when he was age 22, and he dedicated the rest of his life to the exploration of ancient Maya ruins in what is now Mexico, Guatemala, and Honduras. And unlike many explorers, he was fascinated by new technology. That's what drove him, and it's what drove all of his missions in life. So for him, he was inspired by two painters called Catherwood and Stevens, who had drawn some pictures of the Maya world in the 1840s. And so for him, image was what he was trying to capture. So he developed the very first glass plate photography within these countries by taking tons of equipment by steamship from Liverpool, and he created his own bespoke wooden boxes, these giant pieces of glass, silver nitrates, hydrochloric acids, tons of equipment, and also large amounts of plaster of Paris, tons, literally tons and tons of equipment. He got a steamship out to what was then British Honduras, and then he hired a large number of people, maybe 50 or 60 people, created a huge mule train of donkeys, put all the equipment on the donkeys, and then just set off into the jungle in pursuit of ancient Maya sites. And then he spent years in the jungle trying to perfect tropical photography. And so we have, in the British Museum, 
uh, the most phenomenal collection of these photographs. We have more than 800 of these glass plate photographs. And I'd seen these boxes stumbling around in one of the basements one day. I'd seen the Mortley boxes, and then I started looking into the story and learning more about it, and I was like, this is just an amazing story. And what's sad is that they've languished in the basements of the British Museum for far too long and never really been seen, and they're very, very delicate. Um, but they're extraordinary photographs and absolutely beautiful. And, uh, and the other thing he did, is in, in the thought of technology of the time, was create plaster casts of a lot of the monumental architecture of a number of key Maya sites, including Tikal, Kirigua, Palenque, Chichen Itza. And what he did was he wrapped up monuments in plaster of Paris, and then sawed them off into these pieces of, uh, into these pe small little blocks. And then he wrapped them up in horsehair and paper, and he put them into sea crates in 1880, sent them back to the British Museum, where they then languished in the British Museum in a huge warehouse uh, in the east, uh, east uh, of, of London. And so we've been crowbarring open some of these, uh, these boxes, unwrapping these piece mold, uh, pe what we call piece molds of the little bits of plaster, creating the world's most complicated 3D jigsaw puzzle as you recreate the buildings by piecing them all together as negatives. And then also, he, um, at the time, he worked with a man called Lorenzo Nutini to create actual plaster cast replicas from the piece molds in the field. And so we have three large warehouse floors full of these plaster cast replicas of these buildings and glyphs. And he was a man of incredible foresight, because he wrote in his diaries, um, even though I do, this, uh, I, I do this in order to preserve these objects, because I know that in the future, these Maya hieroglyphs, which at the time couldn't be translated, will be preserved for translation in the future. So he did it with foresight of what he was trying to achieve. So, uh, when was it? About a year and a half ago? No, yeah, about 18 months ago, uh, I made a pitch to Google, and I said to Google, Alfred Maudsley is a pioneer in using new technology to communicate cultural heritage. Now that's your job. Give me lots of money, and I'll do a good project. <laughs> and, uh, and they were very nice. They said, I'll give you a, we'll give you a little bit of money, which by my standards was loads of money. But they said, we'll give you a little bit of money uh, and do a little pilot study for a couple of months and then come back and do another pitch in, in a couple of months' time. And, uh, and then and we'll see how it goes. So then they gave, gave me a little bit of money, and then I went back and did another pitch. And Google is like no other research agency, well, it's not research at all, but I mean, it's like no one else. There's no paperwork, there's no forms to fill out. Uh, it's all down to essentially a 60-second pitch. And then this guy sort of sweeps into the room, and then you sort of do your presentation, and then they sort of sweep out again, and you're just like, you either did or you didn't. And so in my sort of 60-second pitch, what I did was um, I basically had a scan of the Maudsley cast, and then I traveled out to Kirigua and recorded a, a little video going to the original location of where this plaster cast was taken from at the site of Kirigua. And I said, give me the money and I will digitally recreate the landscape of these sites and put the casts back into the landscape and then find new narratives that we can communicate to the public. And that was about as long as I had. And then luckily, he liked that idea and he did give me quite a lot of money. And so, uh, and so now we've created a three-year project doing year one Guatemala, which we launched in November last year. We're currently working in, in Mexico, year two, and we're gonna work in Honduras, year three. And um, so they gave me some money to hire a big team of people, and also they gave us some fantastic equipment to use, and also access to the sort of different nodes of Google, and the, the way that Google operates is in these sort of little nodes that do the functionalities of everything that we use on Google. And so this is a, a high resolution uh, digital scanner that we could scan all of the glass plates um, so we've done all that. We also work with uh, 3D scanning now, where we've scanned uh, all of the casts from Guatemala, and we're halfway through all the casts from Mexico, 3D scanning them so that we can recreate three-dimensional uh, three representations of the buildings. So we're taking that idea of the jigsaw puzzle and then putting it together. Because all of these monuments, the plaster casts are like a jigsaw puzzle. So you have to scan each of the individual casts, and then put the cast back together to recreate a monument. Uh, and so this one is Stella E from Kirigua. And so this is actually the largest stone-carved monument in the ancient Americas. It's a 33-foot-high monolith carved on all four sides uh, with glyph blocks all the way down the side telling the story of the king, Kaktilwachanyo Pat, who was in uh, Kirigua, King Kirigua. And so it's a very complicated business piecing this all together. 
but then you'll end up with a sort of three-dimensional file recreated of the actual object. And this is the one that we created of Maudsley. And significantly, uh, archaeologists aren't always the best at their jobs, uh, me included. And uh, unfortunately, in the 1920s, some well-meaning archaeologists managed to snap the Stella in half. Uh, and so at the site today, there's a huge section which has been concreted back together. And also, there's large amounts of machete cuts around it, which have destroyed large parts of the south of the Stella. So this is by far the best preserved representation of this Stella in existence. So then just uh, the guy we worked with in, in, in Google quickly pinged an email to Mountain View, where they're doing some R&D with 3D printing. And they printed out quickly a little model of the Stella uh, from our 3D model, which I'll pass around. And they did it literally in like half an hour, just in this composite plastic materials, just to show it. And so then now you can have a little Stella that you can do it. And, uh, and on the, yeah, and the 3D printing stuff, I haven't probably got time to talk about this, but the 3D printing stuff is absolutely fascinating. So they're doing a lot of work. Uh, a lot of different companies are doing work with 3D printing. And so what our, an ambition of the project now is to, at one-to-one -one scale, print out in stone some of the buildings and then take them back to the sites as a visitor experience so that you can go back inside the buildings in stone and then play with the glyphs at a one-to-one -one scale so they're the same size as the normal buildings. So uh, that's really not too far away. So what we have been able to do is then recreate all of these objects and then put them online so that people can then access and play with them in different ways. And so you can go on there and then spin them around and play with them. And this is both as a sort of research tool and as a sort of public access tool to the monuments. And for the British Museum, I think it's very significant because uh, there are some terrible statistics that I feel unbelievably guilty about with the British Museum. Uh, in the America's collections, less than 1% is on display. But the real killer statistic, which, I, which keeps me up at night, is that less than 5% of the collection has ever been on display in the history of the museum, which means that sort of 95% of the objects just don't get seen or used. Or, or they get used because we get a lot of visitors who come into the stores, but they don't sort of get the public reach they deserve. And so this is a, an interesting way. It's, it's by no means foolproof, but it gives an access to objects. It raises a profile. It gives access in ways which is very different and very new. The other thing we did is go to all of these sites where Maudsley went, and we've done a lot of work with different teams in Guatemala and in Mexico, some of whom were already working at the site and some of whom have come in as part of the project. And so this is the uh, Palacio in Palenque, where the team was in June and July this summer. And we have been geolocating all of the photographs that Maudsley took in the same location. So we've been taking Google Street View trackers with 360 pano capture and doing street view capture of all of the sites. Uh, we've also done uh, a photogrammetric modeling at high resolution of particular parts of the landscape so that we can rebuild them in 3D. Um, and we've been doing lots of work with sort of visualization of landscape in connection to the Maudsley casts. So this is the, the, some of the teams working on the, the, the data, and then we have the data real time in the field where we can pull up the 3D models on the iPads and then show where they are in the landscape. So you can play with the photographs and the objects. So this is, yeah, Kate and Jonathan, who's Google guy, uh, Claudia, lots of people all working at the site. And so, yeah, this is a Maudsley photograph from, that, from the Palacio, showing some of the glyph, glyph work around uh, one of the little recesses. And then today, you can see that a lot of that's disappeared, and a lot of it's gone. And so these, this is the, the record that we have is a really important part of preservation for this landscape. And so what we've done is geolocated those images, and so we can start to look at things like landscape change, building reconstruction work, and that's going back in time from that same location in time. So now, uh, what we're going to launch next year is a Google functionality of exactly that process with all of the Maudsley photographs. So this is an example which, we, which has been sandboxed using a Monet painting uh, from France. But it shows you the technology of what we'll do. So we'll have a map of the sort of Maya world. And then on Google Earth, or in Street View, you can go Google Earth and you can search around. And then you can zoom in using Google Earth. You can zoom in to the landscape today to compare the current landscape today and the capture of today in the landscape with the, in this case, the Monet, and in our case, it'll be a Maudsley photograph. 
And that way, you can start to see landscape change, and you can do research on many different aspects of the sites through a nice front, front, front end uh, of, of sort of digital exploration. And so this, I think, is a very much a value added from Google. When I started working with Google, I was terrified. I thought I was going to be eaten up by this evil monster. Uh, but uh, but it's, it's a very interesting organization to work with. And, uh, and the bit we work with is called Google Arts and Culture. And it is an entirely non-for-profit philanthropic um, bit of Google. They obviously have too much money, and they're giving it away to arts and culture. So I'll definitely take it. <laughs> But uh, so it's very interesting, and, and I have to say on their behalf, like, none of this technology is in any way proprietorial. So all of it goes through any, any machine or any function. or any. So it's not really linked in any way to Google. I think that the, what they're really trying to do is, is trying to avoid paying too much tax and showing that they're doing this good work uh, in, in Europe as a sort of tax break. But it's an interesting one. It's an interesting one. I'm happy to answer questions on that. So this is uh, then taking that idea of the geolocated imagery in a, into the next level. So this is a geolocated image of a, of a zoomorph. So these are zoomorphs, which are anthrozoomorphic figures. They're absolutely stunning pieces of art. They are like three to four meters in length, two meters high. Uh, they're carved on all sides. And they have uh, a human face there with a large headdress covered with these glyphs. Uh, and then these large animals which come over, these animal paws of a giant jaguar with the, the hind of a frog. And then there's this big bird creature which comes up over the top. And, and you can hardly see the intricate detail of them when you're there, but they're remarkable. And so that's me, me a modern and a Maudsley. So what we've done is created the 3D model of the zoomorph. Uh, we've then put it into a virtual reality scenario. So it's a virtual reality of the 3D model. It's a, it, then we sent a headset and two little gizmos, which I'll explain uh, better than that, um, to one of the very few people in the world who can translate my glyphs today. So unlike Egyptian uh, hieroglyphs, my glyphs are only really translated well in the 1980s, 1990s, and there's still only around 20 people in the world who are very good at it. And so one of those people is a guy called Dr. Christoph Helmke, who lives in Copenhagen. So we sent a headset with the gizmos to Christoph, who then put on the headset, opened up the zoomorph in a virtual reality which you can walk around. So the zoomorph is there, and you can move it and walk around it. And then you can manipulate it in real time, expanding it out and in, in the, in the zoomorph. And then with, the, with these brushes, you can then paint in color, or in lots of different ways, the, the translations of the glyphs in real time in the machine. And so then you can create the interpretive narrative of the glyphs, which in this case is a, a, a sort of burial monument to Kaktelwa Chanyopat, uh, and a tale of his, uh, him killing Washaklahunu uh, Bakkawil, uh, who is king of a site of Kapan at the same time. And it tells this sort of story of the object at, in the time. And so that's been done by Christoph. That's Christoph's work within this virtual reality, creating a sort of interpretation of culture. And it's a very, very interesting way of, of looking at culture and experiencing it. I don't know how many people here have used VR in any way. But yeah, so it's a, a fair share. I mean, like, um, and, and, and it's a weird. I've only used it as part of this project. And it's a very, it's a very odd experience. It's a very odd experience. And um, in fact, this is sort of the next stage of that VR experience. So this is just a, an example of the photogrammetric capture that we've done at one of the sites. So this is a very simple technology. This is just taking large numbers of very high resolution SLR photographs. And then they have very nice uh, kit to tie those all together to create a perfect landscape of Palenque in the Google Creative Laboratories in Paris. Then people can go into these landscapes in different ways. So depending on what technology you want to use, you can use just any smartphone put into a simple headset like this, and then you can look around in the 360 3D. You can get other ones like Daydream or slightly more upmarket, which you can put on, and then you can move around a little bit with, with, in the 3D. And then you can use one called an HTC Vive or other technologies where you put the headset on and then you have these two remote controllers where you can teleport yourself around the landscape in the virtual reality. So you point your little marker and then you zap and you teleport through. And so if you do this, you can step, you can walk by just doing this with the clicky thing. You can start to walk around the landscape and then walk around it virtually. And so this is um, the 3D scans of the casts from the Temple of the Foliated Cross Group in Palenque. Then this is just a, a simple video capture of Jonathan playing around in the Creative Labs in Paris just a few weeks ago. So he's put on the headset, he's gone to Palenque, he's turned out the lights to make it more exciting. Uh, 
He's then given himself a torch, is one of the gizmos, to shine it round. And then he's gone around the site at night, exploring the site. And then we've put back the objects from the museum back into the landscape from which they were found uh, so that you can see them in their original location. And then, so then here, you're in the temple, and that is the cast from the British Museum relocated at the back of the Temple of the Foliated Cross where you can then play with it with your little torch and explore it. And then the, currently, the team in London is working on the epigraphy of these to then create a narrative, like translate the epi epi epigraphy, understand what's going on, and then create a narrative for the public so that you can then click on this and it will be annotated and tell you who the king is, what's going on, where you are, and you can create a sort of narrative out of that experience that will then be launched in May of next year. But it's pretty cool. I mean, like, I don't know, like, <laughs> that's what I said when I saw it. I was like, that's pretty cool, Jonathan. I liked it, and it is quite fun to do. And it's like, it's a different way of sort of experiencing landscape. It's a very, it's a very interesting way of doing things. So, yeah, so the end of last year, we, uh, we launched the year one uh, of, the, of the project with uh, all of the 3D images of Guatemala, all of the geolocated uh, photographs, and then a whole series of sort of different outputs that the public could experience. And then everything is fully bilingual. So we have a, an English version of a site and a Spanish version of a site. And depending on your preferences on Google, it comes up in whichever language you're searching in. And then within the, the, the sort of page, we have sort of exhibits where you can explore the collections in different ways and go through a, a sort of little journey, a digital exhibition, if you will, created by different people involved in the team. So some of the Guatemalan team have done little uh, projects on, the, on, the, on different bits of it. Um, we've got these little videos that you can go and like little quite highly, slick, highly produced Google slick videos, which are these little three minute vignettes of information. Um, we have, yeah, different stories about Alfred Maudsley, the 3D scans, and different ways of doing it. And Google, one advantage of working with them is they have great reach. So this website, when we launched it, Google, for one day, put a link to the website beneath the search box in the, every country in the English and Spanish speaking worlds for one day. So it meant that just under the search box, everyone who searched Google, which is like tens of millions of people every day, they could just click on that if they, got, if they took the chance. It was said something like so attractive, like, I don't know, ancient Maya world. And then you clicked on it, and then you literally went into the site. And so it created huge traffic and access to the collections, which normally you wouldn't really get. And that's one which I think is, a, is an important one, is about communication. How do we communicate this information? Technology provides a fantastic tool for creating narratives and exploring the past and the present in different ways. But how is it that you then communicate that? How do you communicate it effectively? Um, and I think, and I'm, I'm not sure who's got the answer to that, but certainly the world is changing so fast that people take their media and their, and their knowledge and their experiences in very different ways, particularly through online and digital formats. And so this is one project which I, I really like and very proud of with the, with the, with the project, which is for kids. So it's a project called Google Expeditions. And so it's being rolled out amongst all primary schools in the UK. Um, and so the idea is that we wrote text for a teacher who stands at the front of the class. Uh, this is mainly aimed at, like, sort of aimed at eight-year-olds, ballpark, because that's when Maya comes up vaguely in the curriculum in the, in the, British, in the British system. And uh, the teacher gets an iPad at the front of the class, or any tablet, and we've written a bit of text. And the kids start off in the British Museum uh, underneath a, a statue of Washak Lhunu uh, And then the, the kids are there, and they have these headsets on, they're in 360, and then the teacher reads out, you know, the text written, this is Washak Lhunu who was killed in 610 AD. Uh, if you want to find out how it happens, then follow me and we'll take you on a journey. And then the teacher presses a button, and then all the kids go to the, the jungle in Guatemala. And there's like, there's a howler monkeys, and they're in the jungle, and they're like looking around. And like, if you've only used VR for the first time, it's like, it's an amazing experience. And, it, and, and, like, and I think it changes pedagogically how people think. If you take people on an experience, it changes like how kids work. Um, and so anyway, this is a, this is a video, which just, uh, this is a nice little slick Google video, which just explains that program. Where would you want to go? I would like to go to the moon, Thailand, Asia, Greece, India, to Nigeria, my homeland. One or maybe all of the seven wonders of the world. When you explore different places, you have the chance to actually learn something new. You want to be able to show the kids that there's something outside of your community that you can go to and learn from and that there's other places you can visit. 
All right, so let's do our objective and we'll talk about the lesson for today. We're going to take a field trip to Verona, Italy to see the place where Romeo and Juliet lived. I'm going to take you on this field trip under the water. Okay, you guys ready? Pick up your devices and look in your cardboard. What is that? Where is it? Whoa! Whoa! <laughs> 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 it allowed us to go somewhere we wouldn't normally be able to go. Are we in China? This is the Great Wall of China. We <laughs> got to see the place itself so we could actually understand what she was talking about. How long would it take to walk the length of the Great Wall of China? How much more enriching than just showing them a picture or just having them read about it? This device can actually make us go to places that we've never been before. It brings the lesson to you. You have to see it for yourself to believe it. There's so much other places to see, so you know that it's never going to end. Google production. <laughs> it's great, it's great. <laughs> it's very slickly done. But it's great, I think. It's a really interesting way. And I think that it's amazing when we start to think about new age of discovery that, like, it's incredible, I find, that kids spend 18 years of their life, like, stuck in these little concrete boxes being shouted at by people at the front of the class, like me and us. But, I mean, um, but it's, it's a way of learning. It's, it's a really, it's not the way that humans really should learn, right? We learn through doing. We learn through experience. And I think that discovery is all about rephrasing the pedagogical systems so that we can learn in different ways. And I think this is or providing different ways of doing that in very interesting ways and bringing narratives from the past to the present in, a, in exciting and different ways that we there. And so, yeah, so then communication. I, uh, I, the last little bit I'll talk about is, is sort of television as a media of communication, because I also make television programs. So I've written and presented more than 15 documentaries for the, uh, for the BBC. And so television is interesting. So it, I'm an academic. I write papers. And I put them on academia.edu, uh, which is what academics do. And they maybe get read by, like, if I'm lucky, 60 or 70 people. You know, it, you get, the numbers involved in output and reach are just so small in the academic world. So, um, so the opportunity came up with the BBC. Maybe I started doing this in 2008. Um, and they said, we want to make a documentary. And there are big advantages and big disadvantages to working in telly. The advantages are that now, like millions of people in more than 60 countries have watched television programs that I've made. Uh, but the, but the, the disadvantages are that the amount of content you can actually put in a, a documentary is really quite small. So, uh, and I work in the BBC with no advert breaks. And I have a whole hour. Um, and so a, a US hour documentary is only 43 minutes of content. Um, and so, and so these documentaries, uh, an hour for the BBC, will be, in terms of total words said in an hour, will only be around 3,000, 3,500, which is less than an, under, you know, an essay that many of you would write, right? And if you imagine that you need to get an hour of information in one essay that communicates an entire culture and an entire story to an audience who probably know nothing about it, it becomes a really difficult challenge to try and do it. But, um, but the advantage is that it is. And so I've made now, uh, yeah, uh, a very large number of documentaries. Um, oh, I'll turn the sound off. So yeah, I've now made uh, yeah, a, a very large number of documentaries uh, all around the world, from like Easter Island to the Amazon, uh, from Bolivia up to the Northwest Coast, uh, and everywhere in between. And, uh, and, and there's one sort of drive of, I try to underpin in each of the documentaries I make, is that each hour, each documentary, has one core theme, one idea that is trying to communicate through an alternative culture from the past or the present. So each, 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 each story has a sort of theme. So, um, and then uh, the other thing I try and do is very much put indigenous peoples and peoples in the landscape front and center of all of the documentaries that I do. So I'm very lucky at the BBC that they allow non-English language interviews with subtitles, and they allow like quite long words, and, uh, and so they're quite tolerant in dealing with sort of quite anthropological content in terms of documentary filmmaking. And, uh, and so yeah, I've, sent, I've, so I've made a lot of them, and if anyone's interested in them, they can ask John and I will give you the links uh, and see some of them. So yeah, so communication in that end thought is, uh, is an interesting one about how it is that we communicate. And I don't think that academics are very good at it, to be honest. And uh, in fact, my big turning point was in 2008. I was at a climate change conference in, uh, in Denmark. 
and uh, I was doing a lot of climate change work then, as I, I still do today. And, um, and so this was the, the meeting between, uh, before the COP meeting, uh, where Barack Obama was going to turn up and uh, arrive, and it was really quite hopeful then that things were going to change. And this was six months before all the scientists got together to update the latest IPCC fourth assessment report, uh, to update the latest data, and then hand it over to a man called Anders Fogh Rasmussen, who was then Prime Minister of Denmark, in order to, he to then take it to the political summit, which was happening six months later. So the conference was fantastic. All the scientists were there, all the academics, and there was this really febrile atmosphere. They were all doing good, it was all about climate change, like they were all changing the world and these terrible politicians weren't doing enough. And then, uh, and then Anders Fogh Rasmussen turned up at the end and he had to stand there on this big stage and then four of the different spheres of the world had representatives of scientists. So you had like geosphere, biosphere, hydrosphere, cryosphere. Each of the representatives got up and they handed over the sort of summary document to the, to the Prime Minister and they hammered it. They were like, you know, this is outrageous, you know, the sea ice is going to be gone from the Arctic in 50 years, you've got to do something about it. And the next guy stood up and they're like, land forest is going to be disappeared, you've got to do something about it. And he kept hammering it, and then Anders Fogh Rasmussen got up, and he gave an absolutely brilliant speech. And he said, uh, I don't know why you scientists are having a go at me. Like, this has got nothing to do with me. It's entirely your fault. Uh, because you are the world's worst communicators to the public. <laughs> if, if the public sensed one fraction of this passion that you have in this room, then, then I wouldn't need to worry because they'd vote differently. But they're not voting in this way, so therefore don't have a problem with me. That's not my job. Um, and so it was a brilliant speech, but it made the point that academics uh, and, and, and sort of scientists, oh, we're not that good at communicating to the public. And I think that that element of communication is vital if we're to not only justify our, our subject areas and our, and our jobs and our careers, but also if we actually are really are going to try and change the way that society operates going into the rest of this, uh, this century. Because uh, the, 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 many of the answers will be in universities like Vermont. And it's a matter of communicating those narratives out into a public sphere where they can have a, a real purpose. And that's very much what I think the new age of discovery should be. It should be about empowering all people to become discoverers. It should be about accessing new technologies to communicate in different ways. And it should be about being effective communicators to a wider public. And so that is my conclusion. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.